Well, let's get into the latest on the Israel-Hamas war. And for that, we bring in national security analyst and former Marine Intelligence Officer Hal Kemper. As always, Hal, good to see you and we appreciate you joining us tonight. I want to pull up this video from the Israeli Defense Forces because we want to talk about what the main story of the day is, and that's these ongoing talks about a potential ceasefire in Gaza. There was an interesting article in The Guardian today, Hal, describing a rumored split between Hamas leadership, for those unaware, Yahya Sinwar, who is the person that you're seeing on the screen right now from this tweet, um, he's the leader of Hamas in Gaza, and Israel has basically deemed him the leader of the October 7th attack. According to reports, it is Sinwar and his men exhausted from the fighting who want to reach a temporary truce deal in Gaza. Meanwhile, the senior political leader of Hamas, Ismail Haniya, has been based in Qatar since the fighting began. He wants more concessions, Hal, before any kind of deal is made in Gaza. I'd like to know from you, how much pull does Haniya have when he's in Qatar, when he's doing this from a distance? The Qataris with the Egyptians, uh, and they're having that direct contact. I mean, the uh, Qataris are basically our interlocutor, uh, along with others, in talking to Hamas. So he has a lot of pull in terms of some sort of diplomatic arrangement to uh, put an agreement in place. Uh, the irony is Sinwar, uh, who has probably more political pull across the movement, responsible for the October 7th attacks, uh, originally he was the more extreme absolutist, if you will, uh, he's obviously October 7th was designed to uh, to basically with the idea that they were going to attack Israel and 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 basically he said they want to do as many October 7th as they possibly can. Well, things have changed. Uh, they've lost uh, about 16 to 17 of their 24 uh, brigades that they have. These are smaller brigades, but they're still fairly sizable. They've taken tremendous attrition across the board. He is worn out. He has been trapped underground for, for heaven knows, I mean, for weeks and weeks and weeks, months, that he can't do anything. And he is exhausted. And and they're ready to try and figure out some way because what they realize is their calculus that somehow this is going to be like every other time where Israel basically backs down after a few weeks and decides not to go go all the way into Gaza, that's all off. Israel's all the way down to the far south. They're going into Rafa. You run out of Gaza at that point. So they're looking for some sort of arrangement. R meanwhile, Hania, sitting in his plush office and very, uh, very nice surroundings up in Doha, which is a beautiful modern city uh, on the Gulf. Uh, originally, it was, it was widely believed he was caught off guard by October 7th. He didn't realize the timing. He didn't, at least that's what's, what's widely believed, is he didn't realize what was taking place until it already took place. And then he was out doing some sort of political damage control. Now he's gone the other way and said, oh, no, we want uh, the Israelis to pull completely out of Gaza. We want a permanent solution, uh, permanent ceasefire and everything else. So it is very interesting. They have completely switched roles in where they stand on this. And the question is, is the political power and influence of Sinwar uh, greater than the positional situation with Hania? And that's what we're going to try and find out. Ania is an interesting character to me, and maybe some of our viewers have this question as well. How can a top guy of a known terrorist organization basically be out in public in Qatar without facing any repercussions? Well, first off, it's Doha. All right, this is a this is a major trade center. It's a very modern city, and and frankly, it's just not some place where you know if someone was going to take him out, let's to use a colloquial term, if there was someone to do a target assassination, that someone would probably be Israel. And Israel has a lot of reasons for not doing something like that in Qatar, particularly now with all the world's eyes uh, looking at Qatar, uh, you know, with the world's media situated in Doha, trying to track these negotiations. And certainly it would be counterproductive because without Hania and some of the people around him uh, operating, there really is no way to negotiate with Hamas without them actually being there. So whereas it, it does seem kind of strange that here they are, no one terrorists operating in the open, uh, they're doing so with the permission of the Qatari uh, royal family, with the permission of the Qatari government, if you will. Uh, they do have formal relations uh, with them. 
And Hamas, uh, let's not forget, was the elected gov government the ruling government of the Gaza Strip. So they were responsible for governing Gaza to include all the aid that came in for quite some time. So where on the one hand, it seems strange. On the other hand, there is a certain pragmatic uh, understanding that they have, that they have to work with Hamas in that regard. And this is where they work with them. This is how Hamas deals with the rest of the world. Yeah, and I want to move to another, uh, really, uh, an issue with one of the Iranian proxies. Axios reports that the U.S. and four of its European allies hope to announce in the next few weeks a series of commitments made by Israel and Hezbollah to defuse tensions and restore calm to the Israel, uh, Israeli-Lebanon border. That's according to two Israeli officials and a source briefed on the issue telling the outlet. I, I have a few questions about this, Hal. First... We've been watching the low intensity tit for tat between the two nations for months. Why would Hezbollah agree to something of this nature right now specifically? Well, here's the thing with Hezbollah. It was widely believed, and certainly Israel believed it, uh, from all reports at the beginning of uh, this this war, if you will, uh, in the aftermath of October 7th, that this was something coordinated between Hamas and Hezbollah, and, Ho and Hezbollah was prepared to launch uh, that phenomenal wave of 130 to 150,000 missiles uh, down upon uh, uh, down upon Israel in the same way Hamas had, had shot its waves of thousands of missiles and completely overwhelmed the Iron Dome system. All right, that was the thought at the time. Hezbollah has not done that. And, and this is something we've, we've been watching. Hezbollah has been involved with border skirmishes, involved with cross-border attacks, uh, you know, Israel and, 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 and Hezbollah have gone back and forth uh, constantly, but they have not crossed what, what it, uh, the IDF calls a key threshold in terms of what they're doing. And Hezbollah appears to be looking at this, all rhetoric aside, and certainly Nasrallah, the head of uh, Hezbollah, has, has, has had some rather, uh, um, rather extensive rhetoric, you know, condemning Israel uh, in various different ways. Uh, and showing his uh, alignment with the uh, cause of Hamas. But with that said, there, there has been no major military uh, movement up on the northern border. And Israel is uh, obviously militarily now very poised to deal with something like that. And I think Israel is also poised to move into southern Lebanon should they choose to do so. So Hezbollah is looking at this from a, a rather practical term. The other side is uh, Lebanon's economy is, is decimated. In, in the last few years, it's lost 50%, 50% of its gross domestic product. The, the economy is, is in horrific shape. And, and if Israel was to go into southern Lebanon, there's a very good chance the entire country could fail and everything that entails. So the Lebanese government in Beirut is also telling Hezbollah, look, it, it's, not a, it's not a choice. If you do this, not only will Israel wipe you out, but it'll probably destroy the entire country of Lebanon uh, in the process. So the logical course of action is for them to find some way to de-escalate this and to find some sort of more permanent situation. And they had an agreement. They had an agreement where Hezbollah was supposed to pull well off the border, uh, pull back, or I think it was about uh, 26 kilometers off the border. And they've never, and Hezbollah has not agreed to that. So I'm imagining whatever comes out of this, there will be a, uh, a pullback of Lebanese forces uh, that will probably be based on a variety of things, not the least of which will be the range of mortars, artillery, and rockets uh, that can be fired into Israel. And that will give Israel a chance to, uh, to reverse the evacuation of all those northern towns and villages and, and hopefully de escalate that entire thing. And I think part of it is you're looking at the end state of of gaza you know the post-combat operations and so everything is starting to back off a little bit i know that may sound strange with all the things going on but hezbollah can clearly see they have nothing to gain and everything to lose by trying to do something now so i think that's the impetus in this it's just the timing and timing is everything in these sorts of uh these sorts of arrangements i want to read the the axios report says diffused tensions could be quote a few weeks away. Is it possible, Hal, that we're waiting for some sort of pause in Gaza or anything else taking place in Gaza before we move forward with anything on the Lebanese border? I think Nasrallah and Hezbollah is looking just as closely as everybody else is 
at the uh, proposal for a six-week ceasefire. And that would give them political maneuver room, if you will, to reach some sort of agreement on this. Certainly, Saudi Arabia is looking at it very closely, and uh, and everyone's looking at it because they look at the six weeks, and the hope is that this may lead to a more permanent ceasefire. And, and of course, the U.S. position, along with a number of our allies and certainly every country that we are allied with in the Middle East, wants to see a, a two-state solution, which has been the U.S. position for three decades. Uh, uh, well, yeah, three decades down there. Uh, has has been that there's a two-state solution that has been reinvigorated. The Saudis reinforced that yesterday. And uh, so I think that's what everybody's looking at. And certainly for Hezbollah, it makes absolutely no sense. One thing I want to point out with Hezbollah, yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're one of their mission, their mission statement, if you will, is they want the destruction of Israel. Okay, that, that kind of goes out. So if you're a terrorist group like, you know, aligned with Iran or whatever, it's kind of in their, your language of your charter anyway. But really what Hezbollah is, is they want, they're a Shiite uh, organization that wanted to take over Lebanon. That's always been their goal. They wanted to create in Lebanon the sort of Shiite theocratic regime that you see in Iran. And that's always been their primary goal. The destruction of Israel, the war with Israel was kind of almost incidental to the real purpose of Hezbollah. And I think Nasrallah keeps this very much in mind which is he doesn't want to destroy Hezbollah and destroy everything that they're really there for to pursue this uh, this war against Israel, which only has one outcome. And certainly, by the way, Hezbollah's looking at the, what would the outcome of that war be? They look down at Gaza, what's happening with Hamas right now, and they go, there's a picture of our future if we decide to get in a war with Israel. And uh, so I think that's that's really driving a lot of things. None of this stuff happens in isolation. Everybody's watching everything else, and it's all about positioning and things. And if you go back to the history of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict back in the 90s, uh, there were all sorts of things where they got very close to going on the two-state solution. And then a few events would happen and everything went a completely different direction. And hence, we are where we are today. I want to get to another report from The Guardian. Let's pull up some video. Uh, this is a file video we have from uh, some of the reports we've covered about the Houthi situation in the Red Sea. Uh, the Guardian reporting that telecom firms linked to the UN-recognized Yemen government have said they fear Houthi rebels are planning to sabotage infrastructure that is critical to the functioning of the Western Internet and the transmission of financial data. Uh, Hal, this is the first time we've heard uh, of p perhaps this type of attack. We're used to hearing about attacks on ships. Uh, what kind of infrastructure are they talking about here? Internet cables? Well, they're talking fiber optic cables. And about 99% of the digital information uh, that, that really governs the global economy travels uh, under the seas in fiber optic cables. And these things go all over the place. There's fiber optic cables uh, that certainly run out of Asia through the Indian Ocean and up through uh, the Red Sea. And uh, these are vital links that link Europe and the rest of the world to the Indian Ocean and Asia, and it's it's how the world is interconnected. This is not a brand new thing. This is an issue that popped up uh, uh, a couple of years ago with the Russia-Ukraine war. You may recall there was a lot of concerns about fiber optic cables uh, off the coast of Ireland, uh, a lot of concerns uh, that Russia was, was interfering with them. There's also been, uh, if you go to the South China Sea around Taiwan, uh, China has routinely gone in there and ripped up uh, fiber optic cables, uh, cutting off internet access to uh, some of the islands that are under Taiwan or under the Republic of China and isolating them from the internet. So this is not a new concept. However, this would have phenomenal impact in the way that uh, probably bigger than the missiles and the drones are having an impact on maritime trade. Uh, if they were to threaten those cables. And this has become, and, and this has been for some time, a, a global security question. In fact, one of the questions is, who's responsible for protecting the cables? They're not government cables. They're privately owned. And the question is, who should be out there providing security for these fiber optic cables, which are the essence of critical infrastructure? So there's a lot of concern. It doesn't take much to go down there and, and mess with them. You can literally, in some places, drag an anchor and hook the cables and, and cause enough mayhem to disrupt the service. And, and that's been seen before. So it's a 
big concern. I'm surprised it's taken this long to come up, but it does tell you something about the Houthis. And one thing I will say is that with the Houthis, regardless of whatever the outcome, even if they stop firing missiles and do other things, the world has seen that the Houthis in Yemen are, are, are a, an, a threat to global maritime trade on a variety of different levels, the last one we just talked about. And the question is, what is everybody going to do about this Houthi threat? What is the long-term uh, relationship that we're going to have with Yemen in dealing with this Houthi threat? Because even if they stop firing missiles or they stop interfering with cables, literally something else could happen in the world. They change their mind and they go right back to where they were and shut down that vital waterway. And in this case, you know, potentially impact digital communications in a, in a very significant way. All these countries, not just Saudi Arabia, UAE, the U.S., the Europe, Everyone is looking at this saying, okay, what do we do about the Houthi threat to maritime trade to include the undersea cables? I, I just want to do one more, and this is the last thing we'll hit because I do want to keep with the Houthis here. So let's pull up this tweet, U.S. CENTCOM putting this out, and I'm sure you've heard by now how uh, Reuters reports the Houthis yet again fired missiles at two vessels in the Red Sea, causing damage to the ships. No injuries were reported, though. Um, Western allies have struck the Houthis multiple times, Hal, and, and, and still, we're seeing reports of this happening. How easy is it to fire the types of missiles that the Houthis are firing, and what are the main challenges that the coalition is facing to put an absolute stop to this kind of stuff? Well, some of the missiles can be fired from rather uh, expeditionary firing locations. Uh, they don't require a big airfield or anything. They can literally be set up in the mountains. Uh, many cases, these are uh, completely mobile launching systems. They can drive up the mountains on a road, pull off, set up, and be ready to fire in a relatively short period of time. So what we're looking at is how well can they aim those missiles. The other thing, too, is the size of the missiles. One thing I find interesting with these attacks, in both cases, the, the warheads went off. In, in neither case did they cause major damage to the ship. They certainly didn't sink any ships. And I think that says something about the effectiveness of our strikes. It's not that they can't put something out there. It's just what they're putting out there isn't big enough to, um, there's no other way to put it, sink a ship. Uh, and they haven't been able to do that. They have caused some serious damage. We would like to stop every type of attack. But these are missiles that apparently have smaller warheads. And uh, so we're going to look at that. The other thing, too, is we could also look at, take, some, take a page from the counter piracy book. We might look at putting various uh, defense systems. One of the things uh, last week, you may recall that one of our warships, uh, its close-in weapon system called SeaWiz, which is, uh, if you go back to the old Phalanx system, it's a rapid-fire Gatling gun with an associated radar, that, uh, that it actually was what engaged a missile that got, well, within a mile of, uh, of the ship, which got a lot of people concerned because it got very close to the ship. How, excuse me. However, that is a, a very good system that could be potentially uh, put on commercial carriers. And we've done things like that for counter, for counter piracy, where we put on a small contingent on a ship. And while they're, while they're going through that dangerous uh, zone, uh, they have a variety of weapon systems that they can employ for counter piracy. In this case, they would have a variety of systems that they could employ against counter drone and counter missile system. That might be a longer term solution on how to deal with this, very much in the same way that we were dealing with the Somali piracy threat some years back. All right, Hal Kemper, uh, always uh, helpful as always to help us break down these complex issues, especially with uh, all these Iranian backed uh, proxy groups that we keep talking about day in and day out. Take care, Hal. Thank you.